morning. Good to be in church this morning. Very encouraging place after this week, and I'm just thankful for for a time to be here this morning. Uh, some of you, you've probably seen a car go by, and uh, that car is for uh, one of the mechanics that uh, volunteers with Propelling the Gospel. And so if you're seeing that car, you have no idea who, who that is, that's who that is. He just had a back injury, and uh, quite a few uh, other minor problems in the, in the view of the Lord, really, but um, still a little, uh, a little bit of a trying time for our family, and their family has been a huge uh, encouragement to my wife and I, and huge help, and have had a huge impact uh, on the aviation ministry. And so if you get that card, just let them know you're praying for them, I think it will be a great encouragement to them. This morning, and we're in Galatians chapter 1, which I already find uh, extremely interesting, the Lord's work of himself. So I've had three individuals talk to me this morning about a study in Galatians, and uh, I don't know what the Lord's doing amongst a couple people here in Galatians, but uh, I'm excited. I'm really excited to preach this message. I think it's a message that uh, also applies to myself and uh, for all of us here in the church. Galatians chapter 1. We're going to look at the first 10 verses real closely for context, and then we're going to jump into the rest of the chapter and see what Paul has to say to the church in Galatia. Verse number 1. Paul an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. So even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than that that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade, persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and tried to destroy it. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from, his, from my mother's womb, and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, he did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up, in, up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, to remain with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things which I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were pure only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God in me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to the church this morning. We thank you for salvation through your Son, Lord. We just pray that uh, we go through, as we go through Galatians chapter 1 this morning, Lord, that there's many principles that we can apply to our lives and use wherever we're at in our culture, Lord. We just pray that you bless this time. Pray for those that are unable to be here this morning. Pray for them as they uh, are traveling, Lord, and just thank you for those that are serving um, maybe a, a little bit different level this morning. Just thank you for their willingness to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Galatians chapter 1 uh, has always been one of my favorite books of the Bible. Um, and the first chapter is really talking about why Paul is writing the the, it's surrounding um, 
kind of the context of why he's writing to the church of Galatia. And uh, to parallel this, we're going to look at what he's saying and, and what he has to, what he's challenging the church. But not that long ago, I actually just happened multiple times where we we put the missionaries we support maybe on a list on a board. And this happened in Sunday school not that long ago. And it's super encouraging to be involved with a church that supports these missionaries. Super encouraging. But there's always a there's always a time that I personally feel, and this could just be me, but there's always a time where I personally feel that there's a little bit of, well, what about us? What about us that are here? What about us that may not be listed here on the side of the wall? But we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning because there's a great uh, call for us that are here within the church. I was going to show you a, a short little video that Ethnos 360 showed. And it's, it's talking about the model of ministry that they use basically to, to reach the, ed, the ends of the earth for Christ. Reaching the unreached. Uh, I decided not to share that because I'm certain the individual that may visit at some time want to share that because she's with them. So, uh, but I like the model. The model is the local church comes out, they parallel with other local churches, and then they go up to another area or other foreign land. And that starts out locally, and that goes out. And it's really cool, you know, of course, they've got some people that don't know what they're doing as far as all that graphics and stuff. It's pretty cool. But they're just little dots that connect locally, and they all go out, form another cluster of dots, and they just keep going. And their whole model is that the edge of the earth moves. And at some point, Lord willing, their, their, their mission is that the edge of the earth butts up to another part of the world that has already heard about Christ. I really like that model because that's us here, locally, that's our church. We parallel with many churches, many ministries that are all around this room and collectively around this room in the of the United States, we've got this wonderful board, little lights that show us where we're connected, locally and globally. And it's, it's very evident in the New Testament that there's a, there's a great uh, emphasis on local church. That's one thing when I came to this church that I love so much is there's great emphasis on missions. But there's a huge emphasis on the local church. And so in, in the first part we see uh, verses 1 through 10 is that there's one gospel. And I've kind of broken this message up into two parts. We've got one gospel and then in verse 11 we start looking into the mission field of God and how God called Paul. And so we're going to look at all that this morning. And... Uh, this book was approximately written, depending on what kind of study you look at, it was approximately written around AD 48 and 51. And you say, well, that's quite a few years. I don't want to pinpoint one year, but it's in that range. Uh, Galatia is a modern-day Turkey. And uh, the Gospel, Revelation of Christ, and I love how one of the verses here mentioned that, that, that this is not of men, but Paul said it's through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, you uh, I'm not real good at pronouncing that Anglo-Saxon word for, for gospel, but basically the good news, the good story. And I know most of us know that for a particular ministry that we support, um, the good news, a reward for bringing of good news. Galatians, the book of Galatians is a stern, impassionate effort to save Christianity from becoming just a messianic sect of legalistic Judaism. How the Galatians themselves react that we do not know, but the gospel of grace apart from works of the law. In triumph, Christianity went on to become a global faith. I hope that excites us this morning. That Christianity did prevail. It did triumph. And it, it did become global. And I'm so thankful for the men in the New Testament. And really the Old Testament that really went out and made this global. And I just so appreciate it. And uh, just think about that so often. Someone like Paul. So one of probably the most unlikely characters to be used for the ministry, you know, in our minds would be Paul, that he was actually used for doing what he did. During his early missionary journey, Paul visited uh, Asia Minor, preaching the message that salvation is by faith in Christ alone, an issue we still face today. We think about it, most, probably 80% of the time that we share the gospel with somebody within our culture, at our job, or wherever, Almost every time it goes back to faith plus works. Almost every time. I have a friend of mine that I work with that uh, recently I had this afternoon where it was him and I 
and uh, we, we have built relationships so it's easier to be a little more bold than normal, uh, hoping you wouldn't exactly fire me, but I had the opportunity to just kind of lay it out there. And we got into it, and he stopped me. He said, well, wait a second. He said, stop, stop. He says, you can't tell me that sharing, basically getting in a plane and giving out Bibles and sharing the gospel is nearly as good as it works or effective as someone practicing with doctors without borders in a foreign land uh, and suffering so that they do that. And I kind of had to stop him. And I said, well, at the surface, that would appear that appears so. Obviously, I uh, said, so, but I think knowing what we know here, you have to go to the heart and say, maybe there's more than that person. Maybe maybe there's a reason why they're serving like that. Maybe maybe we look at the motive, um, and that's kind of what we ran with. But our culture is so wrapped around the, the the emphasis on results, the outward appearance, what's coming out of it, results, numbers, money, and so that's our culture. And, and when, when, you, when people see that we're not based on faith plus works, you get in a whole other conversation, and sometimes it can become very frustrating. Um, the inhabitants of Galatia were known to be restless, warm-like, and changeable. You ever meet somebody where they're pretty changeable, they're, they're really not solid where they're at, even if they're so atheists, they're, they're kind of maybe a little wishy-washy, and... I almost cringe sometimes when you present the gospel to somebody and it's just like, oh yeah, no problem, I believe that. Beautiful. I'm going to pray it right now. Boom, 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 boom. Within a half an hour, maybe on paper, it appears that this person got saved. That usually kind of throws up a red flag for me. Because the Galatians were changeable people. They it seemed like they were kind of, maybe not saw where they were at and easily listened to just grab. And we run into that into our culture, sometimes we don't. Um, sometimes it's almost more encouraging when someone says, well, you know, I really need to go home and chew on this for a little bit. I really need to just think on this, I need to read, and get the word. I could be more encouraged when you I had this just happen a couple months ago where a lady at work came to me into the shop and said, I need to talk to you. And I got an opportunity to share John chapter 3 with her, and she says, you know, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I really need to go home and just kind of chew on it. And I said, oh, no, oh, that's great. Because our culture is so wrapped around having it now, having the results now, and just saying, check mark, boom, done. And I think, I find it extremely encouraging when somebody goes home on their own home and says, yeah, I'm struggling with this. And then they come back maybe two months, a year, and say, you know what? This is the truth. Because the truth can be tested, as our pastor says often. And, and so just wrap your mind around our kind of our culture. You look, you look at our country. That, that's our country in a nutshell. Is is just now, now, now. And uh, so you ask that, what's the motive? Maybe there's more to this person. Look at their heart. This week I got to speak at a Christian school. This is about 10 high schoolers, really cool opportunity, but I went to Christian school my whole life, and I could see it right in front of me, replaying what I went through. Because sometimes in our culture, it's all about results and what it looks like. And so there was a portion of my life where it turned into being a little bit of faith on my part, because I knew it was to be said, I knew what I had to do, so I just made it appear that way. And I kind of could see a little bit, a bit of it playing out, and I was able to encourage them Something that I learned right out of high school was it's a matter of the heart. And there's a great study out there. If you ever, it's a really short book, but it's a great book on focusing on your heart within education, whether that's homeschool, public school, or Christian school. And it was a great study that really changed my, my viewpoint on that. It's the focus of the heart, the motive, where is it coming from? And uh, so we got to talk about that with the teenagers, and it was just a great time. And, and uh, the biggest feedback I got after the chapel service was, ah, I don't need to put on this front. I need to be real. We serve a real God. We're real people. And uh, it's a matter of our heart. Uh, let's see. The false teachers, after, so after Paul was there in Galatia, the, the false, false teachers started to kind of kind of come into the church there. And they were kind of preaching uh, you know, basically that, that Paul's message 
which is qualified. Because you think about it, and I can imagine Paul probably saw this a couple times, but Paul, where his original original <coughs> position was, then being converted after the Lord met him, and then he, he's in this position, 180 degrees out of where he was earlier in, uh, I think it's Acts chapter 13, where the conversion is. But these false teachers are saying, nah, his, his gospel is, uh, is in doubt. It's distorted. We're going to get into that distortion here pretty quick. And uh, so that's what they're saying in these churches. And don't forget, Galatians, like we just said, Galatians are changeable people. So they heard this and it started affecting the church. And as church, we have to be careful of that. That's why there's committees, there's business meetings. Don't need to get into all that this morning, but we have to be so careful to make sure that there's no other gospel than the one gospel being preached, because these guys start preaching faith plus works, which, like we said, eight or seven times comes up. Um, faith plus works. So the first ten verses are, are the purpose of why Paul is writing. He did not originate with the minute. The call to apostleship uh, was divine. It did not originate with men, nor was it communicated from God through some man. It came directly through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. This letter to the churches of Galatia shows a deliberate lack of warmth, changeable even with the false teachers. So in verse 1, Paul and apostles, not from men nor through men, but Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. That is uh, Christ's deity is stated and implied. And I couldn't thank the Lord so much for that verse. Because, because God said his son. That's where this originates. And so that almost kind of negates the whole, the whole being accused of uh, not preaching the right gospel. And I love how that starts. And you go into verse uh, 2, and, you know, that's the address of who it's to. In verse 3, you start looking at grace and peace. Grace, undeserved kindness towards ungodly sinners, and peace, the result of grace. I hope that every day we think about this grace of peace, and what God gives us through those two items. Obviously, Paul makes it known that those two things are very important to him, because in almost every letter, the, the beginning and closing, is grace, peace, sometimes mercy. And just, uh, just think about that, grace and peace. Grace and peace. Verse number four. Let's look at that real quick. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from the present evil age. That's really the cost of salvation. The cost of salvation that you and I are saved through Jesus. These are just items that are really shaping up the rest of the, the passage here that we can really think about every day. Grace peace, salvation. If he gave himself to settle the sin question, then it is both unnecessary and impossible for us to, to add such a work. If you got to add a work, then it kind of just throws out the rest and it really diminishes what God did through his son. And I know we all know, know this, but we're just reviewing it, going, kind of setting up the rest of the passage. It was timely for the Galatians, it was timely for the Galatians to be reminded that they were going back to that very system from which they were saved out of faith plus works. This place, this place is the credit where it belongs, not in man's puny efforts, but in God. And so this, this brings us back to where the gospel originated from. We should remind ourselves that God, God's mission is not to make this world better. I think if we were out of church and we said that in a public place, I think you'd hear a gap. God's mission is also not to make us as men comfortable in this world. God's mission is to deliver us from this world. To deliver us in this world, fulfill the gospel, and spend eternity with the Father, unseparated. I'm thankful for that. Because that gives us great hope because Sometimes our, sometimes our mission is not the same as God's mission. And God's mission is to save us from this world. And we need to coincide with that mission. Be parallel to his mission. 
And so you stop there and you think about grace, peace, salvation, God's mission now, and you move forward. And we watched that great video. All of us here, putting all these guys down for a second, setting them aside, all of us here have great opportunities, day to day, every day, to be parallel with God's mission and share in a practical way. In a very practical way. I had a pastor, I know this not that long ago, and he says, you know this, I, I mean, one thing I really love about people that go to church, go home, sleep, and go to work, is the fact that whether you like it or not, every day you're going to work, and you're with unbelievers. He explained that most pastors struggle to get out of the house, get a cup of coffee, maybe they get to their study, their office, they have a hard time getting out of that room. And it's easy to do, let me tell you. There's been times where I study and I go, wow, I just burned three hours. Where's my family? <laughs> and so it's easy to get wrapped up and really passionate about what you're reading. Because this is a great book. But as pastors, if they're, if they're not getting out, they don't have, sometimes they don't have that opportunity in the access that we have as full-time workers to be an example to the people, the unbelievers. And so it's just an interesting comment that you made. And you said, wow, you know, You've got really good access. And through our conduct, whether it's worthy of the gospel, Philippians tells us, these are all things we think about as we go into verse 6. I marvel that we're turning away so soon. Remember that word changeable. Moving away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Boy, let's be careful. Because I'll tell you, I'll be the first one to tell you that sometimes my actions, sometimes the conversation that I have in that get off track and happen to be in is not good conversations that can pervert the gospel. Because then you've got unbelievers doing this going, I don't really see what's happening here. He acted like this, our conduct, and here's the gospel message. Boy, it doesn't add up. And boy, don't we all know that unbelievers will jump on that so quickly and go, hmm, yeah, interesting. Funny how the world works like that. It's also funny how, since they funny, but ironic how our whole culture is wrapped around that if somebody steps out of the normal, which may be sinful, that the whole rest of our culture says, good for you. But as soon as you go this way and you say, no, I'm standing for Christ, this is wrong. Oh no, that's totally interesting how the world plays that back and forth and it's Clayton against Paul a couple times in his ministry where the false teacher said that's an unreliable source of the gospel. We need to be careful of that. Moving forward. Paul confronts the Galatians at once on their readiness to accept error. God had called them into the grace of Christ and now they were putting themselves under the curse of the law. A perverted gospel. A mixture of grace and law. Verse 10, 8 through 10 Paul announces twice the outcome of anyone who preaches the gospel. What a, what a statement. Let's go back to that word. If anyone preaches, verse uh, 9, any other gospel to you than what you have received, let them be accursed. Accursed. You look up the New Testament Greek word of that, and it means devoted to destruction. Wow. So you look at our culture, you look at our missionaries, and praise the Lord for them, because I believe that every missionary on this board that we support preaches the one gospel. And I'm so thankful for that. There's one board missing up here. And I stopped to pause because I think my mother-in-law was like, oh no. But there's one board, and I think about our pastor. Our pastor is a great example of somebody who is local, church-minded, missions minding globally, and then goes out of the, really the local church and connects with other local churches. And I love that. And he's a great example, and I know there's a ton of other people here that do the same. Did anybody receive the CEF newsletter this week? If you haven't read that newsletter, get a hold of it soon, preferably this afternoon, because it was one of the most encouraging newsletters I've ever seen. And maybe that's the normal, I don't know. But that was really cool. Uh, I want to say over 6,000 something kids interact with CEF at one point of the summer. 
uh, 200-ish, am I wrong, 230-ish, I want to say, decisions for Christ through that ministry. One gospel. I just recently did a study on youth ministry, and I had to meet with uh, four different pastors of four different churches and, and take a survey of how they view and approach youth ministry. And then I had to write a little essay on that and then turn around and sit down with our pastor and get his viewpoint. Some, some of those results, i got to be honest, are a little scary. That's our culture. we got to preach the one gospel. One thing that is so encouraging about this church, nobody's compromising the gospel to get people like this in. There's a genuineness here. And I'm just so thankful. And I was just really stopped for a moment and just thank the Lord big time of how genuine this church is. <clears throat> Preaching the one gospel without really going over the edge. One church that I, I did an evaluation on, that one of their statements was, well, we bring in youth so that they can bring in more youth. Hmm. So I did a little research on that, and there's a lot of churches that go with that method. If we bring in youth, it's more attractive, and so more youth come in, and boom, we got a big church. That worries me because there's one gospel. One gospel, there's no need to do anything else with it. Let him be a curse, devoted to destruction. In verse 8, we see that the apostles use the term angel of heaven. And at some point, you should dig into that little phrase because it says that conceivably they're, they're able to uh, share a burden gospel. And some may go, well, that's weird, angel from heaven. Well, let's not forget who that might be. But if it was the angel of God, it's one gospel. And so even sinful nature, our motive, who's behind it, you have to be so careful. So we're going to shift here a little bit. Things are going to speed up. Verse 11 to 23. But I may know to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to the revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, and try to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and my own nation, being exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me to his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, who did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. And as we're seeing here, kind of Paul, Paul is, uh, my Bible says, Paul to apostleship. And so there's a call. Okay, so we're all here. We've got all these missionaries, wonderful people. If you don't know any one of these people, email them. Get a hold of them. I have their contact info. I tell you, there's oftentimes you'll be maybe going through a little bit of a trying time or maybe you're discouraged on a Saturday night or whatever. And someone like uh, Della Hayes will just all of a sudden email you, or they'll send you a Facebook message. And it's so encouraging to hear from these people. These guys, I don't know who they are, kind of goofy looking, but I love their newsletter. It is fantastic to read their newsletters. Let's not forget where most of these missionaries started. I'm kind of they all started out of local churches. If you look where they started, they started in old person within this church. I played basketball against uh, uh, Jerry. That was fun times. There's a little bit of blood involved. <laughs> it's funny now. But I'm just so thankful for these people. But what about us? We support them. We give. We do uh, faith promise. We do all that. But we're here. We saw in that video these people, the, the doctor or the MP going into the room. We see guys that maybe volunteer at the local public school, which we have here. All these opportunities. Some of us have a great opportunity when some, some of these people have some of the worst days of their lives that they go in for an appointment or whatever. You have that access. That may be, and it's often said, I know we've all heard it for probably most of our lives, but you may be the only little bit of light that they get. And a little bit of light goes a long way. I'll never forget a couple of years ago when our plane flew up from Florida, and it was a cold February night, and I was standing at the Stanford airport thinking, I can't believe this plane is actually coming. 
And I looked up and I see this little tiny flicker. And there was that light. And I'll never forget that. That little bit of light through this totally darkness. Just be a little bit of light. Nobody's saying you need to be me and coming on strong because, like Trent also says, coming out of darkness, a lot of light can be extremely blinding, which hurts our culture. That doesn't go well. And so, going back to our culture for a second, it really shouldn't surprise us that we see a whole bunch of young people, maybe even middle aged people, turning to all this stuff and, and nonsense and, and really weird thinking outside of this gospel because there's so much of this perverted gospel being preached out there. Faith plus work. Man, you can just get rid so wrapped up. It's to the point now where if you try to go onto YouTube and put in, I want an overview of Galatians chapter 1, enter, boom. You could pull up four, ten, twenty different videos on Galatians chapter one, and they're all not going to line up. Nope. It's frustrating. I tried. And it's frustrating. One gospel. And so here we are in our church. And to pull out a couple theological principles of, of what we know about God in this passage is that He's the source of grace and peace. He delivers us from the present evil age. Number two. And three, He pays the full price. Of salvation through Jesus, and you can see the assurance of that in Ephesians chapter 1. Really, the question is where is your mission field? Your mission field is here. Your mission field, maybe to support this, but in your everyday going, it's easy just to get in the rhythm of life, go to work, have lunch, have break, have coffee, go home. I'm, I'm guilty of this. <coughs> go home, 5 30, 6 o'clock, get the kids to bed, throw them in the tub. Or that means poor bed. <laughs> about that break? That's a break. Get him to bed, and then it's just like, whew, that was Monday. Let's do it all over again. And so you get into this, this rhythm. We can't forget, like that video, that we're in our own mission field. And some of us, like Jerry and Kirsten, they went through a time when they were in this, this body as members, very active, like most of us are here today. But the Lord prepared them for something like this. One thing, I, I keep looking at this and I see a, a lot of Asia with no light. That doesn't mean that there's no missionary there. But I wonder if someday the Lord might supply that out of our church. Who knows? Only the Lord, but it's just, just because you're here, don't think that the Lord's not going to use you. You look at the ministries here. That Christian school I went to this past week, I was about to stand up, and the principal said, are you from that church with that really awesome youth group? <laughs> well, to be totally honest, I said, I'm really not involved with it. I really wish I could be, but I'm really not. And she goes, no, 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 no. She goes, you see those four teenagers? They all go to your youth group. So I said, oh, yeah, I didn't really know that. Anyway. It was just so cool to hear that on the other end because really, you look at the way you through this, nothing's changed outside of this one gospel. This one gospel is preached, and that's it. There's nothing drawing people in. There's no free, oh, there might be free candy at the door. <laughs> but there's nothing really big lights and big show and, and feelings-based gospel that our culture is moving into. And this, this is nothing new. Paul's talking about it way back then. But in our ministry, in our mission field, let's preach the one gospel. Let's do our best on a daily basis to get into this word so that our conduct backs up the gospel. And let's also watch out for those false teachers. I saw a little bit of it, not, not that I went up to the individual and said, you're a false teacher. But oftentimes you get talking in a group of, of so-called Christian circles, and you sit back and a little red flag goes up. The more that you grow and the more that you spend time with the Father, can I just tell you how many more red flags go up? A lot. A lot of red flags. There's one gospel, and I think this is a great, great challenge. God calls us away from pleasing men to pleasing Him and sharing the one gospel. We face scary statistics about beliefs and religion, religions within our own country where the gospel has been perverted, mixed up, and distorted. So will you take a stand, all of us, where we're at? Not necessarily in this church, because I realize that 
probably 90% of the church here serves in this church. But what about the times where Awana is packed up? Maybe it's maybe it's uh, shot up in the night that nothing really happens, but something's always happening here, which is great. But just think about maybe during the day, Monday through Friday, it's one in the afternoon, and you're not here. You're not at Awana, you're not at Hangar Bible, or whatever the case may be, but you're at work. Just kind of go. Be a missionary in that in that time. Don't let global missions diminish you being a missionary here. You look at Maine, one of the least church states per capita. At one time it was worse than Alaska. It might still be, I don't know. But what about Maine? And those of you that are involved with the, the aviation ministry know <laughs> the emphasis on Maine. But think about where you're at. School, work, hospital, shop, the opportunity. I, I love Wednesday nights Bible study for the guys because there's a lot of times where somebody comes and says, this is what happened this week. I didn't have all the answers, which you don't need all the time. But there's got to be something within us that kind of disappoints. It's a little bit of light. And that's the encouragement this morning is, is there ought to be something there that says, bingo, right over here, one way, God. Steps in which way we, we, we can take and share the gospel where we're at. Stay with the Lord. Don't try to add to it. Just stick with the Lord. One thing that, that sometimes gets a little on my nerves is Including myself, I put on this, this front where I go, I really need to be, you know, in my office with the door shut, no kid. I am so unqualified <laughs> to be able to do what the Lord has called us to do. It's, it's, it really puts us in our place. Even being up here definitely puts me in my place. But to be out there, we need to be genuine. We got a real God for real people. Think so? We need to share the real gospel. Do it for the Lord. Don't do it for anybody else. Don't do it so that you come in on a Sunday or or you able to go to a Bible study and say, "Well, this is what we did." It's not about us. It's for the Lord. We need to really relish in God's grace and peace. Stick true to the one gospel of grace, saving salvation through Jesus. And the last one that we know about Paul is he was a servant. Everybody here serves in this church. I know that, I see it. That's the, the biggest thing that spoke to our family when we visited here was serving. You're served where you're blessed. You give where you're blessed. And uh, just think about that. A young girl weeps in a far distant land. She has no one to show her God's love. No mother, no father to wipe away her tears. She cries out in the night alone. Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll go to dry that young girl's tears. I'll serve you no matter where the path may lead. Lord, please bury my heart. A mother grieves for her starving child. She has no shelter from the cold. Earthly provisions will ease their suffering. But who will feed their empty souls? Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll give the gospel to the suffering ones. I'll go wherever you want me to go, Lord. Please bury my heart. Will you ignore these lost souls in the night? Can you hear their pleading cries? They're begging for someone to show them the way. They must go before another one dies. Bury my heart in the mission field, Lord. These distant voices won't fade away. I'll do your will, whatever the cost, Lord. Please bury my heart. We, some of us probably know that song. But can I tell you, I believe that Paul's heart was buried in the mission field, locally, globally. And can I also say that all these people in the wall, their heart is buried in the mission field. Well, what about us? Is our heart buried in our mission field? At work, school, your kids play sports, you're in that group, you know that the majority of those groups, that's your mission field. And so, when you think about that video, you think about when you go to work tomorrow, unless you have the day off. You go to work this week, you're in your mission field. Don't put it on the front, be real about it. But know that God's mission is to deliver us from this world. And every day that we come in contact with these people and an opportunity comes in and we keep silent, we're misaligned from God's mission. Now, I will be the first to tell you, 
that one of the things we don't do when we fly into some place like maybe Freiburg or Augusta is that we don't go up to someone and we greet someone up the head with a Bible. You build relationships. And so when you're at work, you have those relationships. You have those relationships. And if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, those people will see that in you. Something's different. I'm sure we've all heard that. So share the gospel where we're at. Daycare, hospital. We all have great access to the opportunity on a daily basis. I challenge us to pray this together. It's something that I've started to do, and it just kind of sets our mind practically for you today. And it's this. When you're on your way to work, pray that something within you, of course, this helps by being in the Word, but something in you just points to the light. We did those bracelets for our camp that gloom flows in the dark, give the verse. It's also a great reminder to pray for the ministry here in Maine. But if you, that will, and it doesn't, you know, flow in the dark that great. I see you guys, it's kind of all dull. <laughs> but just a little bit of light. Just a little bit of light to point that way. There's a study note in my Bible that says the work of the gospel in the lives of believers should cause onlookers to glorify God and motivate non believers to come to Christ. So, what will we do? Where will we go? How will you approach it? It's time to take a stand for this one gospel. And by, by sticking to that one gospel, you stick to the Word. One thing I'm really excited about for the day, if, if the Lord continues in, in leading our family, is, is someday being able to preach what they call exegetically or expositionally, and, you know, like Fred does, John chapter 1, John chapter 2. Because by doing that, you can't go wrong. By just sticking to the Word. Nothing else. There may be books you read that, that aid in maybe approaching, maybe a study, and that's great. But there's also a whole lot of books out there that try to take this and stick it over here. One gospel, folks, this morning. One gospel. So what will we do? How will we approach it? Because there's people out there in our community. Plumbers. Hannaford. Aroma Joe's. That's the best place they give a Bible, by the way. It really is. They give you a coffee, you give them a Bible. That's, that's where our culture is at right now, is, is going back and forth like this. And so, this morning, as we get ready to go out as a church, we go out. That's our mission field, not any falls. We come back here to get encouraged and go back out. Come back Wednesday night, amen. We go back out. Omana, the kids. Can I just tell you, from a, from a dad that's got a little guy, that sometimes he may seem a little shy and very quiet, when he comes home, the kid is just rattling off what's going on and what he learned. I forget how he said it, but I said, buddy, what did you learn about? He says, uh, he was supposed to be King Solomon, but it, it, it was a, a really wacky name. And I said, oh, was he good or bad? He goes, oh, he was really good. And uh, so, Oana, all those things prepare the people of this church to go out, youth group. There's been some of our own teens that have texted me and said, hey, that bracelet was great because it reminded me what my mission is, where I'm at, in the sports, wherever. And so that's the challenge this morning, and, and stick to the one gospel. Paul was a local guy, local churches. Obviously, he made himself kind of around that part of the globe. And uh, I just find it extremely encouraging because you look at all these people. And really, if I was really sneaky, they'd be like a whole camera facing this way because this is also missionaries. This is a whole other mission field that some of these guys don't have the access to like we do. And so when you go out this week, let's just simply share the gospel in a real, clear way without beating it up and saying, this is the gospel. And together we do that. That's, that's our mission as a church. Not to only support them, but here. And I believe that the Lord is doing great work in our state locally. And I'm just excited. Really excited. I was super excited to share this message because the more you think about what's going on and, and uh, as a church, it's, it's super encouraging. And I pray that it is encouraging to you also. So how, how can we serve and make the impact so that they can, too, know the Lord and, uh, and glorify Him, like Paul says in that last verse, that they glorify 
him through me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the time to be in your word, Lord. And we're greatly reminded, Lord, this morning that, that you've got one gospel. There's no need to, to uh, go out and around it and, and build more upon it, Lord, and don't add works, Lord. And we're just so thankful for your, your true free gift, Lord, to us, Lord, that, that was not free. And we just thank you for the salvation through your Son. We pray that we're able to take these principles, Lord, and just, just take a few things with us as we try to just be a little bit of light for you, Lord. We pray that you bless this time. Thank you for all those that are serving in, uh, in various ministries throughout the day. As we go home and invest in our family ministry, Lord, we pray that you bring everybody back home safely as we get back in the Word, Lord, tonight and prepare for another week where we just seek to share you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Let's turn again in your new books. Number 513. 